That is good. Okay. And we're rolling? Okay. Okay. It's 5.01, not 5 o'clock. So I just want to name that, that I am responsible for you all hearing this a minute late, maybe two. But they want to set this up. Um, so I can actually jump in, and then you can film me like while I'm going. I, okay, I'm, I'm so always late, and I'm so sorry for it always. And I feel like one of the best ways for me to like make up for that is when I'm on time to like give people as much respect as possible. Um, so just some housekeeping or whatever. Uh, this is the like free snack area. If you're hungry, you can come up. Like while I'm going, please get water too. It's lukewarm. Sorry. Um, and uh, I also want to say that this um, this place is child. Uh, we provide child care if anybody is a parent or has kids with them or knows someone who might want to come and they would want that, please let them know that we can make that happen for them. Um, and okay, that's important as well. So, okay, my name uh, is Alyssa Pariah, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. And I don't know if any of you saw that on the uh, flyer or on the event page here, but um, I don't just say that as like a virtue signal. I say that because I think it's important. And when I am in uh, spaces where people are um, organizing, I usually will suggest that people do include that. And uh, it's not just a way to show how woke you are, uh, but you can very quickly say what a pronoun is. Um, that when people refer to you, if they don't say your name over and over and over again, which is an option, some people's pronouns are actually their names. So you will have to just say their name over and over again when you refer to them. If not, typically you will use a gender pronoun and you will refer to them as she, her, her, he, him, his, they, them, theirs. And um, uh, I say that that is important because um, I think about a time when I did not feel comfortable talking to a lovely group of people like you, that the only people that I had in my life were people who were very much like me, uh, other trans women who were black and brown in the New York City area who did survival sex work in order to live. Uh, the only people that I had in my life at that time were people who were just like me and uh, my clients who I had sex with in order to uh, survive in the world. And I didn't talk to anybody else, and not because I thought badly about them, but because I assumed that they felt badly about me. And please don't cry for me because I'm okay now in that vein. Um, but uh, at the time, that was my reality, and I just assumed that people would not want to see me or hear me or even want me in the world. And uh, as a result, I just didn't show up in places. So I would not come to a place like this uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago in my life because I would assume that at a uh, university where there are halls of learning, um, all of the, the normal cisgender people who are there would be revolted by me that would probably treat me badly, so I better not go there. So when we think about organizing, if anyone here is a student organizer, please get ready to talk about your organization because that's going to come later in the program. But for people who do that kind of organizing, I think that it is worth it to bring that out, to uh, let people know that uh, one of the ways that you honor uh, trans and gender queer people is to say, I want to know how to refer to you. It matters to me what you have to say about yourself. I will not impose that on you. I want to respect what you have to say about yourself. And if that is a gender pronoun or a gender identity that uh, I may not be able to recognize off the bat, I want to give you the benefit of the, the doubt to tell me how you are. So I think that if uh, we, um, anyone in this room, are involved in movements, campaigns, and organizations fighting for justice, that we think about offering that small little tidbit to people um, who experience that kind of gendered oppression. So that is why I say, my name is Alyssa, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I say that whenever and however I can when I go into a space of people that don't already know me. Um, so I think that uh, that tidbit can be condensed down and shared out into uh, your networks when you go out into the world. So it's just something to think about in terms of how we uh, can be inclusive. So um, my history, uh, I 
am a founding member of the Gender Justice or Trans Justice Program at the Audre Lorde Project in New York City. That was in 2009. So um, the Audre Lorde Project is an organization that seeks to build on the legacy of Audre Lorde, uh, the woman and the legacy herself, uh, because before she passed away, and she did tragically pass away of cancer, and we miss her every day. Um, before she passed, she talked about uh, what it is that she wanted to forge in the world, what she wanted to build. Um, when she died, she was actually in community with other uh, socialist feminists in Germany. Uh, and uh, there's actually a very good documentary about the last days of her life that I would suggest that you all watch because uh, it will be informative for you in some way, trust me. Um, she wanted to be very conscious about forging a community with like-minded people in order to change the world. And uh, that was something that for her sometimes presented a problem, not just because, hello, you don't have to be you know, careful as you come in. Come in, we love you, we welcome you. Please have a seat however you want. There's food up here and there's water if you're hungry or thirsty. Um, she felt that that was not something that was uh, available to her in meaningful ways because Audrey herself uh, was indeed a black woman and uh, a lesbian. And she found that when she went into spaces that were fighting for justice, whether those be spaces that were <laughs> feminist spaces, um, Audrey's uh, activism in uh, much of her life was centered around um, being uh, in the women's movement, or if she was in black power spaces, um, organizations that were fighting for racial justice against white supremacy. Frankly, she found in both of those spaces she could not totally be herself. If she was in a black power space where there were other people of the diaspora, um, and I will talk about the diaspora and do some unpacking of some terms, and I will talk about why that's important as I go as well, but um, she felt that she could not bring her full lesbian woman socialist self into these spaces that she felt oftentimes were homophobic, patriarchal, and indeed nationalist and reactionary um, and uh, hostile to her identity and to her politics. When she went into uh, women's spaces, feminist spaces, uh, that seeked uh, to build the women's movement, uh, there was often a call for black women and women of color to put aside their sort of racial problems um, as to get the wins uh, that the movement needed. Think about Gloria Steinem. We love Gloria, but Gloria has some problems. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, we can talk after this. Uh, so um, the call to um, uh, racialized women in the movement was to put aside their racial gripes in order to push forward um, wins that would matter. And uh, this angered her to no end. Much and much and much of her writing is about her frustrations in these arenas and her um, undying yearning to uh, forge and maintain spaces and communities and indeed organizations where uh, these problems would not rear themselves. And that is how um, she lived and died. So the Audre Lord Project seeks to build on that legacy and to be a very, very intentional space where queer and trans people of, of color that live in the New York City area um, have a hub for organizing and for building community. And it is in the Trans Justice Program, which is a pointed area uh, that mostly centers on um, intervening for uh, trans women who get caught up in the legal system so that uh, we can learn how to do jail support because for the record, uh, fuck the NYPD. If there are any people here who love the police, we can also speak after this. <laughs> um, so that is uh, my background and I am very grateful to the Audre Lord Project for providing that for me because it did absolutely uh, change my life. Um, so it was in 2009 when I went into the very first uh, trans justice community school under the leadership of a woman named Maya Vasquez, M-Y-A-V-A-Z-Q-U-E-Z, -E uh, who is also uh, Afro-Latina. She's Puerto Rican, oye, Boricua. Uh, um, and um, she um, helped me to begin to see my own 
uh, potential to be a change agent. Um, so whenever I talk about how I learned something or you know the kind of work that I've done, if there's someone who had something to do with that, I just want to acknowledge them. I doubt any of you will go home and Google her name. But if you do, I think you'll be very, very, very impressed with Maya's body of work. Um, she's still very much alive, still very much kicking. She's an incredible woman. And I'll just say that. One of the first things that we learned in the school under Maya's leadership was about uh, as the namesake of uh, this event says, hello, hi, there's food up here and water, and you don't have to tiptoe, we're all here, okay. Um, so one of the first lessons that we learned was about working across difference, and that's what this whole thing is called, and I'm very glad that you're all here. So um, hello, come in, water is life, no dapple, I'll talk about that at the end. So you are a prophet. Um, so... Um, uh, there was a group uh, of disability um, rights and dignity advocates who were pushing for the MTA, the Metropolitan Transit Authority. They are horrendous. Uh, if anybody's ever been to New York City, you can say amen. Uh, nobody. Um, so um, it, it, is, it, is a, um, it is a very sad day when you go underground into the subway system in New York City. Um, but uh, that is how uh, most of us get around. So on this day in 2009, uh, members of a collective that were fighting uh, a campaign to push the MTA to install um, accessible elevators uh, at every station, every station in the city. And in case you don't know, there are actually very few stations in New York City, the big metropolis of the world, that still puts their garbage out on the street, even in the nicest neighborhoods, so that rats and roaches can come and have a feast every night. I have problems with New York City and our leadership. Um, they were coming to our group to talk about their work to make an appeal to us to help them build their fight in order to make every subway station accessible in New York City. Now. Um, the other um, black and brown trans women who um, I don't have the time to name, uh, none of us uh, at the time used a wheelchair or needed uh, that kind of uh, accessibility to be able to get um, to the subway station, at least at that point in our lives. So um, one might say, well, why would they come to this organization and specifically to this group in order to uh, make the case for people to help join their fight? Well. Okay, Audrey teaches us uh, that working across difference is how we transform society. So no, none of us in this meeting in this, uh, at the uh, Trans Justice Community School needed that service, but so what? Um, while yes, it, it, uh, it is moral, it is right, it is righteous for all of us in that meeting and all of us in this room right now to uh, stand in solidarity with people uh, who uh, are called disabled in this world because of the ways that their bodies function under our current, under our current mode of production. Um, yes, it is right. It, we should do it. But also, um, in terms of why they came to us, we can think about, hi, how are you doing? There's, there's food and uh, water here, and you can sit anywhere that you want. Um, we can think about how trans bodies uh, are policed and judged as being not valuable or valued as less. Um, in uh, some overlapping ways, some different ways that also people who are called disabled in this world are seen as less than, that their bodies um, are not as fit in this current mode of production. Can you be productive? Can you make money for a capitalist? Can you operate in the world in a way that does not disrupt these systems? If the answer is no, I would argue, and Maya argued, and Audrey argues that you would do very well to find out where those intersections are and to fight along those lines and to do the very hard work of finding people who have a material interest and moral interest in fighting that fight with you. That means serious, serious organizing. That means thinking critically about where the, the places are, where, the, uh, where the, the breaks are in the armor of the state in order to push forward your vision for justice. So in that case, that might have looked like, hey, when we have a rally and we want 10,000 people, we want you to help us so that we can get elevators at every subway station in New York City. Okay, we'll do that. 
we will turn out all of our people. We'll do everything that we can to get that out. And when we wage our fight so that every municipal building in New York City is gender inclusive, that they have a gender neutral bathroom, if not abolishing the gendered bathrooms uh, that exist. There's a women's bathroom right across the hall. Hey, sis, go in the bathroom right now. Hey. Um, uh, if someone goes into that bathroom and, or let's say, if I go into that bathroom and somebody in the hallway recognizes me as trans and decides that they want to fuck with me and they say, you shouldn't be in this bathroom, you were born with a penis, um, well, then I'm going I'm to have a hard time. Uh, so what does it look like to forge a fight and to hold to account the city of New York City or for the University of Minnesota to say, this is unjust and we want a different way. We want to be able to then call on our allies who we've just made that are in the disability rights movement. Many of them, if not all of them, may be cisgender. I will say what cisgender is. I'm going to get to terms in a minute. But let's say that they're all cisgender. Why would they want to join that fight? They're fine. Well, we've already forged that, that, that line of solidarity. We've already said we will show up for your fight. You know what it's like to have to fight for bathrooms that are accessible to you. Every bathroom, well, this bathroom anyway, I don't know about every bathroom in this building and on this campus, but uh, in most public places that you go to, they have a larger bathroom that is wheelchair accessible. That was something that was fought hard by disability rights activists um, that fought for the American disability uh, rights that we, that we uh, sort of see all around us and don't even know. These are hard fought. So they know a little bit about what it's like to experience oppression, particularly in a bathroomed sense. Um, so working across that difference is something that is extremely important. But us knowing that is not something that comes out of thin air. It's not necessarily natural. People have to write these ideas down and share them out. And this is one of the reasons that we uphold Audre Lorde as being a person who put forward these ideas, that gave um, words and, and, and a, uh, a program in order to push that forward so that people in the fight for justice can be able to bite into them and understand them and go out into the world and advocate for them. So that was one of the first lessons that I learned uh, in the uh, Trans Justice School in 2009. So um, it is, oh wow, I got very, very far. Um, so I want people to uh, then think about um, the terms that I'm using. So I know I use quite a few. Um, my background, um, what I pulled from the community school and my work since then is to do inclusivity trainings. Um, if any of you had been to an inclusivity training, you probably found it very exhausting. Inclusivity trainings are exhausting um, the way that they are usually taught. Um, I've seen them. I've been in them. I go to conferences with these people all the time. And it's all of this woke virtue signaling. Uh, you know, we want to uh, really take the time to name the fact that the ways in which we show up to the work can sometimes be exclusive of this group and that group and we must be able to check our privilege and think about how we should, and there's a lot, a lot of buzz, a lot of buzzwords in order to, you know, if you say enough of them, somebody is gonna know, oh, she's woke, oh, okay, she's down with us. It's, it's really not accessible. So one of the main things that I do when I do inclusivity trainings, and by the way, I do them and I'm for hire, I'll be here for like six more weeks. So if you're in a union or an organization or some uh, place of worship, you know, give me a call. Um, uh, I think it is very important to pull that out and to show it to people and say, if you are doing inclusivity trainings and you are trying to get across to people that they are not bringing in and retaining the people from marginalized communities, uh, that ideally, if we're good, if we're, if we're efficient, uh, we will reflect the very communities that we seek to serve. So uh, in any organization that's seeking to get any goal, for example, the last uh, inclusivity training that I gave was in Portland, Oregon. Olivia is from Portland, Oregon. Hey, Olivia. <laughs> Olivia is going to chair the discussion uh, after, after we're finished. Um, uh, and I went to their tenants union who was there. Um, the tenants union uh, wanted to put forward a positive vision. They knew that um, Portland, Oregon has a lot of transgender people. It's like a mecca for trans kids to go to, trans families or families with transgender children go to Portland, Oregon because of the kind of uh, community that's there and, and what is available to them. That doesn't exist outside of like a moneyed and classed 
paradigm, but we can get to that. Um, anyway, uh, and P Portland, even though it is the whitest metropolitan city, a really ugly uh, superlative, but that's what it is. Uh, there are plenty uh, people of color there, and uh, the tenants organization or the tenants union said, okay, well, uh, this is not being reflected. We want to do what we can to bring in trans bodies. We want to do what we can to bring in people of color, and how can we do that? And uh, when they put out their RFP, their request for a proposal, um, there was a member in there that thought, oh, I know someone, Alyssa, why don't you come out and why don't you do this thing? Now, if they had gone with someone who typically does inclusivity trainings, they might have gone through the very exhaustive process of having someone come in and beat them over the head with their own privilege to tell them how fucked up their being and how they need to change their ways if they want to do anything at all that's worthy of the societal change of which they seek. Now, there are people who depend on this, uh, hi, hi, there's food and drinks up here if you want it. Um, there are people who depend on this uh, guilt. I would call it liberal guilt, cis guilt, white guilt. It's their bread and butter. It's how they make money. Listen, the, uh, under capitalism, uh, I hope that you can figure out a way to make money because you might die of exposure or hunger if you don't figure out a way to hustle in this world. So I can't knock the hustle, but, you know, I do have a critique. <coughs> and it would be, this is not the, the way forward. If you think that just because you can make a buck off of people who are feeling guilty over the very real material ways that we are oppressed in this world, then fine, you should do that. That's good work. But if you're doing it by beating people over the head um, through your rhetoric, well, then you're, you're really going to uh, be stymieing the potential that people have to forge the kind of solidarity that we need to get what uh, we deserve in this world. Because in my experience, guilt does nothing but make people feel frozen uh, so that they can't go forward. So in this context, that would mean that the tenants union in Portland, Oregon, and Portland, Oregon desperately needs a militant and successful tenants union because they don't have rent control. We don't have rent control here. We're going to talk about rent control tonight, and I'll get to that at the end. But we desperately need it. The developers here and the developers there run the game. So uh, the rents are going sky high. People are being priced out. People are being sent into homelessness. People um, are experiencing abuse from their landlords. Let's go down and down and down and on the list. Portland must have a militant and successful tenants union if people get the kind of justice that they need. Now, the reason that they brought me out there and what I was hoping to help them to do is to fill that tenants union with people so that they are reflecting the city of Portland. So if there is, I don't know, what is it, 6% uh, of uh, yeah, black people in Portland, your, organ your organization better have at least 6% black people. If we know that uh, there are um, 300,000 people uh, in Portland, Oregon, who identify as, uh, <laughs> as trans, well, you better do some math and figure out what that means for your organization because I think that that, uh, to, you know, that same fraction, I'm not very good at math here, I can talk all day long, but don't ask me to do an equation. Um, that's, your union better have that many people in there, and if it doesn't, then you need to commit yourself to recruiting them, developing them, prioritizing them, and making sure that they understand your project and are dedicated to winning it. Because if you don't do those things, well then I would argue that you are failing, and you better figure it out. So I gave them some tips and tricks about how to table, uh, how to make events. I don't know how many of you saw me right outside this building in the last two days screaming like I'm screaming now. But uh, if you did, it worked, and I'm happy to see you. Uh, but uh, really thinking about training them so that they know how to go out there and do that, to get the people that they need in order to enrich their movement so that it can be successful in the way that people need and deserve a movement like theirs. But if they would have had someone, hello, there's food and uh, drinks up here if you're hungry or thirsty. If they would have had someone who would have came in and the whole time berated them with what we would say is privilege theory, and we can talk about privilege theory in, in, the, in the section coming up, because I think that while one, <coughs> it is very important for people to be able to recognize their social location and to be able to hear it when someone who is from an oppressed group tells them that they're being a fucking asshole, you should be able to hear that. And I think that privilege theory has some holes in it, and we should be able to debate that out honestly. But people who would do inclusivity trainings would treat it like it's gospel. And one of the things that I say is that uh, these ideas that seep down into the movements that actually come from academia 
uh, are, are not ideas that come from heaven. They come from people who are trying to get a PhD. Mm. So should we be basing the way that we see fighting for social change off of that? I would argue no. And privilege theory is one of many theories that come from academia that I think are good in some ways and flawed in others. And we better do a good job of parsing that out if we hope to be able to win the kind of justice that we say that we need in the movements that people need and deserve. <laughs> so, um, all right. So my inclusivity training looked a little bit different. And um, I am uh, largely influenced by Audrey's vision of working across difference uh, in order to push me in that work. So um, I want to now just speak briefly about Audrey, who she is, what her history is. So has anyone here read Zami or knows what Zami means? Okay, one. You're good. Okay. Zami is uh, Audrey's uh, biography or what she calls her biomythography. And if that sounds flowery, uh, it is. Audrey is a really, really beautiful writer. She's a poet. Uh, she calls herself a warrior poet. Um, and uh, the, the language in uh, the book is very beautiful. And it's also out of sync uh, in terms of time. Uh, she uh, groups it by uh, theme. And it's very beautiful. Um, so uh, she is born in Harlem, New York City, and uh, experiences a lot of racism, sexism and homophobia, if you can imagine. Uh, and she is born to immigrant parents who come from Curaçao. Curaçao is in the Caribbean. Honey, we're thinking about the Caribbean tonight, just the Oriqua and honey. The, um, the, um, the hurricanes are knocking out the power and killing people in islands across the Caribbean. I just want to name that for a minute. Um, so <clears throat> Curaçao, uh, has a, a, a large um, diaspora of people. Diaspora is uh, people who um, are descendant from uh, African people who were stolen and uh, sold in the slave trade. So I actually met someone here while I was um, tabling, and it, and it brought out to me something that uh, I should probably talk about. So she asked if, you know, looking at the picture of Audre Lorde and maybe having like a vague impression of who she is, so she's African American. I said, oh, not exactly, but she's of the diaspora. Now, this woman, black woman, gorgeous, smart, all the things, didn't even know what it means. What is diaspora? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Again, this is why we have to parse out uh, meanings of things, right? If I have made any statement, <coughs> If I've said any phrase or word that you're not familiar with, I hope that you bring it up either during the discussion or after we leave here because it's very important. <clears throat> a lot of times we assume that people know um, what we're talking about and, um, and that can like create a, uh, a feeling that like, oh, if you don't know this, there's something wrong with you. What's wrong with you? You don't know what the diaspora is? Are you fucking white supremacist? <laughs> uh, you know, but no, no, pe people don't know, right? Like, uh, smart black women on this campus, at least one, doesn't know or didn't know, because you know I told her, what the diaspora is, right? So I said, no, 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 it, it's people who are descendant from uh, stolen people from West Africa during colonization and the slave trade. So, you know, a lot of them, well, some of them did come to the United States, and we might call them African American, they might call themselves African American. Uh, but no, like my people were from Puerto Rico, right? Uh, there, are, there are a lot, a lot of black people that are from Puerto Rico. There are a lot of black people from Curaçao, and uh, Audrey's family is, is that. So when she's growing up, she talks about um, being traumatized by her classmates and teachers, like so many of us are, uh, who uh, made fun of her <laughs> nappy hair, uh, that she smelled like rice and beans, uh, that uh, she was fat and stubby, and uh, when she got older that she wasn't interested in boys and that her body was wrong in X number of ways, and she talks about how that was deeply traumatizing to her. That when she moved into her sexuality, like so many of us move into our sexuality in different ways, she felt deep, deep shame for the desires that she had, because no, she didn't have desires for men, and God damn it, that's okay. But she didn't believe that. Nobody in her life told her that that was okay, except maybe, you know, the, the small community that she managed to find in the West Village. Uh, the West Village in New York City is historically uh, a neighborhood where uh, gays and radicals used to come together and find that, you know, as rejects, they could uh, make themselves feel safe, at the very least, for some of them. 
that's also very class, then we can go there as well. Mm -hmm. um, so um, she talks about this being uh, extremely important to her development, uh, that uh, the people that were around her were radicals, people that were socialists and communists, hey, what's that? Uh, and um, people who were engaged in the feminist movement, in the black power movement, uh, people who were um, in the lesbian scene, and people who would go on to fight in Stonewall. And I don't have enough time to go into that today, maybe the next talk. Right? Socialist students? I mean, bring me out. Um, uh, because I can go on and on and on about uh, Stonewall, uh, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera. I can't say much about them, but I will just say, learn those names, Google those names, learn the history. It might inspire you. Um, so um, I want to say that um, in her work, she does not pull any punches about her sexuality. In fact, uh, in addition to uh, Orgy's theory of um, working across difference and the theory of difference, she talks about another theory that she develops called the power of the erotic. And yes, she does mean that in a sexual sense. She is talking about her sexual engaging with other women. She talks about their beautiful breasts, the folds of their vaginas, how they taste, how their bodies sweat on top of one another. She goes in. I mean, it's like almost erotica. It's, it's kind of sexy. Uh, so, um, yes, she talks about that being the power of the erotic and how that was able to transform her and, and inform uh, her politics and her work. But also she talks about how under patriarchy, uh, anything that uh, sort of comes out of us that uh, men and women and non-binary and all people across the gender spectrum, things that we do, things that we think, um, that are sort of deemed as shameful, um, are, and not just sexually, but in terms of how we engage with one another, what we have to say, the kind of movements that we find ourselves in, the things that we derive pleasure from, sexual and not, are things that need to be interrogated. And if we're feeling shame, we should look at that. Why am I feeling shameful about the way that I am presenting gender, the way that I'm performing my gender? In any sense, the way that I'm performing my sexuality, the things that I love to do, the people who I love to do it with, that rather than feeling shame or sort of like seeing it in a very uh, sort of uh, um, flat way of being like, oh, well, this turns me on. So this is what, well, there's more to it than that, she would challenge us to say. She would say that if we tap into that and we think about where that comes from, if we think about the fact that that's something that has been ripped out of us, if we even do some work of uh, looking at history to find out what other cultures and what other times in the world was this not part of the paradigm and why? What is it serving? And Audrey would challenge us to say that that is the erotic that the thing that gives us pleasure, the thing that we feel shamed about, the thing that uh, somebody might put us down for, we might want to look at that and think about how to actually put water on it, how to, how to nurture it, how to bring it about so that actually, rather than feeling ashamed of it or quieting it when we get into the key places, uh, instead, we put it forward, right in the front, and use it to inform our politics when we go out and do the work. And I have to say, that that has been incredibly empowering for me. I was not joking earlier for people that came in and you weren't, and you weren't here in the very beginning. One of the things that I said was that uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I absolutely could not be here talking to you all yelling at the top of my lungs like I'm doing right now. I'm also talking for the people that are in the hallway. I hope you hear me and I hope you get something out of this. <laughs> um, I couldn't do it because I was deeply, deeply mired in shame. I am a brown trans woman in this world that comes from poverty. Uh, my experiences are wrought with trauma and abuse and harassment. And they were the first sensations that I would know and remember in this world. And I acted like it in my life. And I did not engage with people who I did not already know, felt like, oh, maybe I do deserve to live in the world. But I pushed past that because I looked at what it is exactly that I'm ashamed of, why I'm ashamed of it, who does it serve, how can it be transformed. And that is actually something that has empowered me to push back and put it in the front rather than trying to hide it. And I put it in the front and I said, and what? 
I can be in this world. I can go anywhere I want to go. I can talk to whoever I want to talk to. You may not like it, but you know what? This is who I am. And uh, I'm not going to be sorry about it. We can talk about it. I'll educate you. We can have a discussion. But no, I'm not going to put it to the side. I'm going to be my whole, whole self. And in my asserting that is how I'm able to come to you with as much volume, with as much power, with as much force in my life. I'm able to do that because of what I was able to grab from Audre Lorde and her power of the erotic. So, um, I want to say that um, between these things, I want to highlight things that are going on at this university. So, I said to people, you know, if any of you are activists, you know, like, you know, raise your hand, get to know one another. Um, and I say that because the people on this campus who are involved in organizations <clears throat> and movements and campaigns, for justice at this university are people who you all need to know and love and work with and commit yourselves to. I would argue, um, figure out a way to relate to them. The people that do the work, figure out systems that make it easy to relate to you. Because I know that this is a working campus. Half of the people who I talk to, when I told them about tonight, and, I, and the, the ones that I believe, uh, that said I have to work, I said, oh, damn, where do you work? And I wanted to know about what, what they do and, you know, all the things. A lot of the people who need the kind of justice that we see as uh, a, a goal for this university, they, they can't give the time that maybe we can give. We need to think about ways to be able to plug them in, to be able to utilize them, to tap them on the shoulder and say, I know you don't have a lot of time to come to an organizing meeting, but we are having an action on this day. Can you come with 10 people that are in your network and commit to showing up and doing this part of the action on this day against this target in order to get this. Hey, if you, if, if we are dedicated and we are militant, we will develop those structures so that we can plug people in. Socialist students is one. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, and uh, or thank you very much for having me here and being here. But like I say that it is important for you all to know each other in order to get what it is that we need. One of the people that I talked to today is an adjunct professor at this university. This university is fucking rich. And they pay their adjunct professors shit. And this woman has been here for 20 years and says that uh, her daughter already makes more money than she does. That's a, I mean, like, you know, no shade to her daughter. I'm sure her daughter is, you know, very capable and, you know, does good things in the world. But, you know, she's an, as she, uh, what, the job that she just got into is entry level. And she's making more than her mother, who's a professor, shaping minds of people who pay a lot of money to be here. And uh, that she can't even make ends meet. So what does that look like? So uh, she talks about how this university has been uh, doing everything that they can to bust up their union so that they, they can't collectively bargain at the table. This university is fucked up for that. And uh, it's not enough for all of us to sit here and think that, wow, that's really messed up. The person that is uh, doing all of this work to make sure that I get the education that I need and pay for um, isn't even able to make ends meet. Well, yeah, thank you. Morally, that's right. That's right. It's wrong. But guess what? There is an organizing campaign. And I do hope that you support it. It's through SEIU, Faculty Forward. Um, and I think about somebody else who I talked to. Um, I spoke to uh, a hijabi woman. I know that uh, Minneapolis uh, has the distinction. Hey, sis, how you doing? Um, if you want, there's food and water up here if you're hungry or thirsty. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, they, uh, that this city has the distinction of having, like, the highest concentration of Somali people uh, who live here, right? And a lot of the women uh, cover, right? So they wear hijabis. There are students on this campus, open white supremacists and fascists, who talk about going up to them and pulling their hijabi uh, the, off uh, the back of their head and thinking that that's funny and making, and making memes about it online that are being shared by people on this university, and the administration isn't doing anything to make sure that that doesn't happen. I saw some of these people today with their stupid little fashy haircuts and their suits. I'm not, that's ridiculous. And the university needs to think seriously about how to protect the people that are here. And if we want to talk about uh, dollars and cents, the people that are also uh, paying to be here, you're prioritizing people who want to make a joke out of their existence in order to be able to what? To, to protect them against the people that they're joking about terrorizing. Yeah, real cute. So I would argue that people um, under the leadership of women who are hijabi, uh, uh, women who are African and who are Muslim to uh, be able to uh, pair with the organizing committee of, of the, the adjunct faculty. And y'all should be able to um, link together and say, I'm going to show up for you, you're going to show up for us, and this fight is going to be victorious on all fronts because of what we did. And Audrey tells us that. That's what we learned from her. That, I mean, if there is 
a, a, a woman who is um, on the um, the organizing committee or is fighting for the union, who's an adjunct faculty, and is also uh, um, a woman who covers. Well, then that's great, but that that's a very small intersection. Everybody needs to be in that. Anybody who thinks that those fights are righteous and believes in them, y'all better join forces and wage both of those fights together all the time. Um, so I think about how important oh, that is for this um, campus that has a lot, a lot, a lot of fuckery happening. So um, I want to end my piece here um, by saying that um, the people who want to uh, wage these fights um, must uh, think very seriously about the kinds of people that they put in leadership, the voices that they listen to, who it is that they're centering, and how uh, they, and I say they like it's not you, and how you all are going to build the structures uh, to be able to fight for justice uh, at this university and in this city. So I'll leave it there. Thank you all very, very much. Um, let's have an open discussion. Um, uh, Olivia is going to chair it. And then at the very end, I'll come back for a couple of points. So thank you all for listening to me go on and on. Yeah.